Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and welcome to part two of Rocks, Fossils and Time, part one. So in the previous video, we've just been talking about sedimentary fasces. So if you remember, sedimentary fasces was the result of distinct environments of deposition. So each environment of deposition will be reflected in the sediment that's being deposited. And because each environment of deposition is different, it's going to produce a different sedimentary rock. There's going to be something distinct about it. And so we can use these distinctions to work out, you know, these sedimentary fasces, which essentially says, right, what environment was this sediment being deposited? So the sedimentary fasces were, sp were first noted by Amans Grizzly in 1838. So what he did is he traced the sedimentary layer in the Jura Mountains of Switzerland and he noted that the rocks graded from sandstones to mudstones. So he was on a walking holiday, he was just strolling along and he happened to you know, decide to just look at a layer of rock as he was going and he noticed that initially when he started looking at the same layer, uh, layer of rock it wasn't sandstone and as he walked over time that sand slowly gave way and transitioned into a mudstone. So what he did is he interpreted this change as reflecting a transition from a shallow water environment which would be sandy to a deeper lower energy water environment just like we've been discussing. So we essentially decided that what he was looking at was the transition from the sandstone fasces going into the shale or mud fasces. So uh, any attribute of sedimentary rocks that makes them recognizably different from laterally adjacent rocks of the same age is sufficient to establish a sedimentary fasces. So we have laterally adjacent environments which are the same age. We have three laterally adjacent environments, a sand fasces, a mud fasces, and a limestone fasces, a carbonate fasces. So these are our three distinct environments and they're operating at the same time. And each one is going to produce its own distinct sediment or sediments. And so we can use those to define that particular fasces. Now, we need to remember that different fasces can have the same rock types. So, for example, mudstones can occur in a whole range of different environments. They can be part of the continental shelf sequence. They could be part of the abyssal plain, which is the very, very, very deep ocean. Mudstones can be deposited in lakes, or they can be deposited by deltas. So there's, you know, that's just a few of the environments where we can get mudstones turning up. So just by seeing a mudstone doesn't you know, mean 100% that you're in a you know, marine environment and you're in the shale fasces. What you have to do is you have to use other indicators such as sedimentary structures and fossils in order to definitively be able to, you know, in order to definitively identify the environment. So in the case of things like uh, lake mudstones, we would expect to see things like freshwater fish fossils or maybe uh, tree leaves mixed in with the sediment and fossilized. And so that would tell us we were you know, in a continental setting. It, you know, when we're looking at things like deltaic environments, abyssal plain environments and continental shelf environments, we might look at the fossils possibly. And we can use those to work out, you know, were we in deep water, were we in shallow water, or were we in an environment where sometimes the sediment was exposed and sometimes the sediment was underwater, like a delta, because deltas, of course, occur on the coast, so they're going to be affected by the rise and fall of the tides. So there's going to be lots of little indicators in our rocks, which is going to help us further refine our model and work out exactly where the sediment was deposited. Okay. So we've already touched on the fact that the sea level will change. And you know this actually was quite a major problem for early geologists. So early geologists had a bit of a conundrum. So when they were walking around, they came to a you know, relatively rapid conclusion that rocks like limestone were being deposited in marine environments. However, in some instances, you could get limestone miles away from the coast. I mean, huge distances. And then there are other weird things like there are whale fossils in the Sahara. You know, if you know if you know anything about the Sahara, you'll know it's definitely not the type of environment in which you would expect to find a whale. You know, and obviously going back to the, the fact that we have limestones in weird places, Kansas City, which is arguably one of the most central cities of the United States, nowhere near a coastline, is underlain by a sequence of carbonates, muds, and sandstones. Which suggests, you know, which suggests at one point it was part of a coastal setting. So 
The early explanation for this was quite simple. They employed scripture. So they said, right, the reason that these are here is because of the Great Flood. There were also some people that suggested faulting. They thought, right, well, maybe what's happening is rocks are being taken from the coast and they're being pushed inland by faults. And OK, that, that would work, but it would be pretty much impossible to push a piece of rock from the coast to Kansas City. That's just too far. So faulting, yeah, it could work on a, a local scale, but, you know, when you're talking over a big scale, it just it just can't do it. So, you know, how do you end up with these, you know, with these rocks and fossils in locations where you wouldn't expect them? So here we go. So here is a whale fossil in the Sahara. And over here, we have a the sequence of rocks underlying Kansas City. So it's uh, from the Carboniferous. And you can see that it consists of carbonates in blue, the muds, muds in grey, sands in yellow, and we have these black layers here, which are coal layers. The fact we have coal tells us that we were in a coastal environment, because the vast majority of coal deposits are associated with coastal environments that are partially flooded. So, you know, there's kind of swampy environments that we get on the coast. Think of somewhere like the Florida Everglades would be a good example of that kind of setting. So this would suggest that during the uh, during the Carboniferous, Kansas City was actually part of a coastline. So what's clear is that the shorelines must have migrated over time. So this requires one of two possible things to have happened. Either the sea level has to have changed relative to the land, or the land has to have changed height relative to the sea. Either way, you're going to end up with a relative movement up or down. So the movement of the shoreline inland, so that's when the sea is covering over the land, that's termed a marine transgression. When we have the opposite, so we have the sea, the shoreline moving out to sea, so the sea is in retreat, so the water's leaving the land, that's a marine regression. And each of these two events is going to produce a different sequence of rocks. OK, so let's start with a marine transgression. So what we're going, what's going to happen is we're going to see offshore fasces, the continental shelf fasces, are going to superimpose themselves over nearer shore fasces. OK, so if we look at what's happening here, so here's our initial situation. Here's our coastline right there. And as the sea level begins to rise, the coastline will obviously move inland with the sea. And so this means your sand fasces will steadily migrate inland. Well, as the sand fasces is migrating inland, the mud fasces are going to follow, and the carbonate fasces are going to follow the mud fasces. And so already you can see it right here, we have mud fasces superimposing themselves over, carbon, over sandstone fasces. Over here we have carbonate fasces superimposing themselves over mud fasces. And so we have these offshore fasces, the carbonates and the muds, superimposing themselves over the nearshore fasces, the limestone, uh, sandstones. And this will continue. So as you can see over time, the sea level keeps rising. We now have the mud completely over the top of these earlier sand deposits. Same down here, we now have the carbonate completely over the top of these earlier mud deposits. So in the case of marine transgression, the fasces are going to become younger in the landward direction. So this means if we follow this layer of sandstone here, it means the oldest part is going to be down here, and the sandstone is going to get steadily younger as we move inland. So this is going to be young sandstone over here, this would be old sandstone down here. So the age of them is going to be different. So as we're following just the layer of sand, it's not all the same age. This is going to be old, this is going to be young. So this layer of sand does not have one uniform age. It changes laterally. So if we were to take a borehole at the position of the original shoreline, so right here where this red line is, um, what we would see is we would see a change from shallow fasces to deep marine fasces. So we would see a shift. We would steadily go from the shallow marine sand fasces then we'd have the moderate depth mud fasces superimposed over the top, and then eventually, given enough time, we would have the carbonate fasces, the deeper water fasces, superimposing themselves over the top of the mud fasces. And so we end up with a sequence like this. It goes sand, mud, limestone. Very classic sequence. 
So a great example of this is the Tonto group. So the Tonto group is part of the sequence of rocks that makes up the Grand Canyon. And you can see the Tonto group right here. So the Tonto group, Tonto group sorry, has the uh, Tapit Sandstone at the bottom, the Bright Angel Shale in the middle, and the Moave Limestone at the top. Sandstone, Mudstone, Limestone. Sandstone, Mudstone, Limestone. So this sequence here is representative of a marine transgression. So we know in this area, during the Cambrian, there was a steadily, steady increase in sea level. And the Tonto group itself extends from kind of the, the Utah-Arizona border all the way to South Dakota. And it youngs to the east. And so this means as you move eastward, so as you move from the, the kind of, you know, uh, kind of move from that Utah Arizona kind of area and start moving eastwards or should I say northeastwards to be more accurate towards South Dakota you're going to see the rocks steadily getting younger so for instance this would be the um this would be the kind of Arizona Utah border and then as you move this way you are heading towards South Dakota so if you to follow the same layer of rock over time it would get steadily younger eastwards and so this tells us that the sea level uh, was moving from the west. So the sea level right started in the west and the sea was encroaching in an easterly direction. Okay, so what about a marine regression? Now I am going to be honest straight away and say that these diagrams here are absolutely horrendous, but we'll, we'll do the best we can with them. So in the case of marine regression, we're going to see nearshore fasces superimposing themselves over offshore fasces. So what's going to happen is the sea is going to retreat. And so what we're going to get is if we're here in these kind of moderate water depth mud fasces, well, as the sea level drops, the shallow water sandstone fasces are going to start encroaching over the top. Obviously, as the sea level drops here as well, that means these, these moderate depth mud fasces are going to start encroaching over the top of the deeper water carbonate fasces. And so in the case of marine regression, what we see is we see a reverse of the sequence that we got with a marine transgression. So first of all, we're going to see the fasces becoming younger in the seaward direction. So if I was to follow a layer of sandstone, the older sandstones would be here, and then they would get steadily younger as I moved away from the land and towards the ocean. Now, if we took a borehole, once again, out to sea from the present shoreline, what we would see is we would see a change from deeper marine sediments to shallower marine sediments. So in, we're gonna see the reverse of the marine transgression sequence. We're gonna see a limestone at the bottom, which is the deeper water uh, sediment. Then we're gonna see a shale come over the top, which is the moderate depth sediment. And then we're gonna have the sandstone over the top of that, which is the shallow water sediment. So once again, what we've just been talking about there is all to do with the relationship vertically though, isn't it? But we've already touched earlier on the fact that stratigraphy is not just about the vertical, it's also about the lateral, the horizontal. So this then brings us on to something called Wolfler's Law. So Johannes Wolfer, uh, like Grizzly, argued that changes in sedimentary fasces in layers of the same age represent contemporaneous adjacent depositional environments so he thought just like uh, Grizzly that um, Grizzly sorry that um, what you were seeing when you saw these changes from one different type of sedimentary rock to another was that you were looking at your you were going from one different environment to a new environment and each of these environments was operating at the same time so what Wolfer noticed was that the same fasces he found laterally were also present vertically so he came up with Wolfer's Law, and this simply says, fasces seen in a conformable, and conformable is an important point, there can't be an unconformity there, okay? You can't have an unconformity in your sequence if you're going to use Wolfer's Law. But nevertheless, for Wolfer's Law, fasces seen in a conformable vertical sequence will also replace each other laterally. And as I said, the law only applies to conformable strata. You can't have an unconformity. So how does it actually work? Well, 
One of the problems we have as geologists is it's actually relatively easy to find a vertical exposure. But as I touched on you know, a, you know, a few slides ago, laterally is more difficult because the rocks can be eroded away, they can be gone, you know, they can be lost completely. So you know, tracking lateral changes can be a bit tricky. However, what we can do is we can use the vertical changes and we can use those to predict what we would expect to see laterally. So here's our basic situation. So in this case, we're going to focus on section B. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, pretend that this is our cliff face here. So we have a sandstone at the bottom. We have a siltstone in this kind of pinky red. We have a claystone in the gray and we have a limestone in this kind of peach color. So that's our vertical sequence. Sandstone, siltstone, claystone, limestone. Now, According to Wolfer's law, as long as this sequence is conformable, that means we will see the same rocks appearing laterally. Okay, so if we think about it, this dashed line here is going to represent rocks of the same age. So each of these fasces is going to represent the different depositional environment, isn't it? This is going to be our shallower, higher energy environment. And then we're going to deeper water. Water's getting deeper. Then we have these deeper water offshore carbonates just like the diagram we saw a few slides ago so we're going just going to skip back here we go we're going from our sandstones into in this case in that diagram siltstones then into mudstones and then finally into carbonates so this line here represent rocks which are the same age okay so all the rocks along this line here would be the same age okay so this would mean, therefore, that the rocks as we go up here, they're getting younger, and we can see that the water depth is increasing, isn't it? We're going from these kind of siltstones into the claystones into the limestone. So we know the water is getting deeper because these fasces, these deeper water fasces, are superimposing themselves over the top of shallower water fasces. Whereas below this level, we obviously know the rocks are going to be older down here, so we can see we have shallower water rocks down here. So this is clearly telling us that what we have here is a marine transgression because we have deeper water fasces superimposing themselves over the top of younger fasces. Uh, sorry, we have deeper water fasces superimposing themselves over the top of shallower water fasces. Sorry about that. And so this means that we can then predict what's going to happen if we follow this layer of sandstone. Well, once we know it's a, marine trans it's a marine transgressive sequence, we know therefore that the, la 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 the layer of sandstone will young inland. So we therefore know that our layer of sandstone will get younger in this direction and older in that direction. So what Wolfer's Law is allowing us to do is it's saying, right, well, we can see this vertically. We therefore know what's going to happen as we move laterally from our starting location. And as a geologist, we can look at the vertical sequence, we can work out what's going on, and we can use that to predict what we're going to see laterally. So as soon as we realize that what we have is a marine transgressive sequence, well, we therefore know that these siltstones must be superimposing themselves over the top of the sandstone. And we know the coastline is over here, so we know the layer has got to be moving this way. We know the claystone has to go over the top of the siltstone that way, and we know the carbonates have to go over the top of the claystone. So... We instantly know what's going on, but Wolfer's Law allows us to, you know, be confident in knowing what we're going to see if we were to move laterally from our starting location. So, since the Neoproterozoic, so that's 541 million years ago to the present day, North America has undergone six widespread marine transgressions and regressions. So these are events where a lot of, if not all, of the United States and a good part of Canada has been completely under seawater. So these cycles are important in shaping North America's geology during the Paleozoic and Mesozoic especially. Now they've been less important in the Cenozoic. The extent of the migrations and the you know, withdrawal that comes afterwards is determined by analysing outcrops of similar ages across the continent. 
So what we'll do is we'll you know go to as many locations as we can and we will try and find rocks of the same age and we'll say right you know were these rocks being deposited on land were they being deposited underwater and if they were being deposited underwater was it a shallow marine setting a mod moderate depth marine setting or was it a deeper water marine setting and so this is going to allow us to work out you know show us how the environment changes over time so i can be at a location like x here and I can see that over time, so you know this is this is the layer of rock I'm going to be looking at, okay? But I can see over time that the next layer is getting deeper water and then deeper water again. And so that allows me to work out what's happening. It lets me see what's going on in the area. And by looking at how the rocks change at all these different outcrops, I can work out what's happening. So all of these here are the same age. And then if I, you know, then if I go right, so this is 450 million years old, then I'm going to look 10 million years later, so I'm going to come up here maybe. And then in this instance, I'm then going to see that my um, my silt fasces has been covered over by a claystone fasces. And so I know that the water depth is increasing. And so I know that over time, what happened was, is the water depth got deeper and deeper. So as the rocks get younger, I can see the water depth getting deeper. So I know there's a marine transgression going on. That also allows me to work out what direction it was moving. So if I look at all these different locations, okay, and I take the same level, well, I can see that location A here, I started off in a claystone and, got super, and then a carbonate got superimposed over the top. At location X, I started off in a siltstone and then the claystone and then the carbonate got superimposed over the top. At location C, I started off with a sandstone and then the siltstone, the claystone got superimposed over the top. And so this allows me to work out what's happening over time. So at each of these different locations, at each of these different times, I can see different rocks. So I know over here, I'm in deeper marine setting, moderate marine setting, shallow marine setting. And so I can see these changes occurring over time. So the extent of the migrations withdrawals is determined by analyzing outcrops of similar age. So it's difficult to accurately estimate, estimate the rate at which marine transgressions and regressions occur. So by carefully mapping the lateral extent of fasces movement, and we help, you know, we bracket this by fossils of known dates, it's possible to produce a maximum rough estimate of a few centimeters per year. So if we were thinking of quite a large marine transgression, so something that moves the coastline 1,000 kilometers inland, so that's quite a big move. Well, let's say that occurs over 20 million years, that would equate to around 5 centimeters a year, so surprisingly quick. However, what we also need to remember is that marine transgressions and regressions are not constant events. You don't just get a marine transgression and then a marine regression. What happens is, is that you have this you have a marine transgression and then it will stall for a little while. There might be a little retreat and then not and then it'll advance again. Then there might be another retreat, it will advance again, another retreat, it'll advance again. So you know, so to cover that one thousand kilometers may actually take a lot longer than you would initially have expected because the marine transgression doesn't just happen in one go. It happens over several stages of advancement and retreat. And this advancing and retreating of uh, the coastline as these marine transgressions and regressions occur obviously helps to produce the intertonguing that we were talking about earlier in the presentation. So we can also have transgressions and regressions occurring in response to tectonic movement of the land. So here's quite a nice example. So this is the island of Haiti. And this was uh, this was after a 2010 earthquake of a magnitude of around seven on the Richter scale. So quite a big earthquake. So what we can see here is we can see the red areas are areas which have been uplifted. So the fault movement has allowed the land to go up. While the blue areas here are areas which have essentially dropped due to the fault movement. So we can see in the areas that have uh, have been pushed up, we can see we have reefs which were underwater have now been pushed above sea level. In the case of the areas which were once above sea level, we can see, for instance, here we have a beach that's now covered by the sea. 
here we have houses which have now been completely submerged and here we have i'm not 100 percent sure what that is i'm just going to say it's a playing field of some kind which you know used to be a fair distance from the coast and now is right on it so this is an instance of you know changing the height of the land relative to the sea the thing is is that these uh, tectonic movements are very very localized so if you look here we can see that this particular earthquake produced a movement over a distance of well there's 10 so on 10 20 maybe maximum about 40 kilometers in length so this fault movement produced a very limited change in sea level by causing the land to move up or down relative to the sea so tectonic changes typically produce only local shifts in the sea level if you want bigger more large-scale stuff it pretty much has to be due to the sea level rising relative to the land so the classic example of a um, of a marine transgression is during the Cretaceous so during the Cretaceous period we think that sea levels may have been up to 250 meters higher than present day and there's a couple of reasons that we think this is the first reason is that during the Cretaceous we think that seafloor spreading was running out of control and so this meant that at divergent plate boundaries huge amounts of new oceanic crust were being produced now this obviously means if you're going to produce huge amounts of oceanic crust you obviously need lots of magma to make that oceanic crust and so that means underneath these divergent plate boundaries you must have had huge amounts of magma waiting to be used to make crust now the thing is is this means because you have these huge amounts of magma well that magma is going to naturally want to rise and so all that magma is going to push the spreading ridges up okay so we think that spreading ridges in the Cretaceous were pushed up substantially versus spreading ridges now. They would have been a lot higher. And so obviously, as you push the seafloor up, including the spreading ridge, what you're doing essentially is you're displacing seawater. And that seawater has to go somewhere, and the only way, it can, only way it can go is onto the land. So that's the first reason we think there was this big marine transgression in the Cretaceous. The other thing is that, the, is that the Cretaceous was a period of quite large volcanic activity. And so this is obviously going to put, put lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This means there's going to be quite a potent greenhouse effect. And so this means we aren't going to have glaciers. And you know glaciers are very, very helpful because they lock up water. Well, if there are no glaciers there, then that means any water that was held in glaciers would have been released and it would have entered the oceans. And this, once again, is going to help to drive the global sea level up. So this is the situation that we had. So here is a, 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 a map showing what we think was happening during the Cretaceous. And you can see that huge amounts of northern Africa, northern South America, North America has essentially been cut into three pieces got the Rockies here we've got you know what would be modern day Canada there we've got most of the United States here in this landmass we can see that Europe is just a mess right now most of Europe is underwater and you can see that a substantial part of uh, Western Russia and large parts of Southeast Asia are also underwater as well and once again this is you know a, a combination of the result of these spreading ridges being pushed up displacing water and these very very high global temperatures meaning that there are no ice caps notice no ice at the south pole no ice at the north pole at the same time we also have these huge volcanic eruptions arguably the biggest of the lot was the deccan traps in india and this purple area here shows you the extent of the deccan traps it was substantial and these are flood basalts so this is where we have cracks fissures opening up in the surface of the earth and huge quantities of mafic lava pouring out onto the surface you can kind of see that here each one of these layers represents an individual lava flow and you can see there are hundreds of them okay along this entire vertical extent you know this this cliff is going to be hundreds of meters high so that shows you the sheer amount of lava that was being put out by these eruptions so where you have lots of lava being erupted obviously there's going to be lots of gases associated with that of which the most common is going to be carbon dioxide 
So obviously, though, this has to have come to an end eventually. So the question is, well, why did it stop? So during the early Neogene, so we've gone from the Cretaceous into the Cenozoic now, we begin to see the global sea levels dropping. And there's a few reasons for that. Well, number one, the spreading ridges began to slow down. So as the spreading ridges began to produce less oceanic crust, that meant less magma was required. So the amount of magma underneath these spreading ridges begins to drop. Less magma means there's less of that upward push. And so as the amount of magma decreases, the crust begins to slowly sink back down. And so this obviously means that the crust begins to sink down. It allows water to re-enter the ocean basin. We also have a decrease in levels of global volcanism. So that's obviously going to mean less carbon dioxide is being put into the atmosphere. That means a weaker greenhouse effect and we're going to see global temperatures begin to drop. We also see the formation of the Himalayas. Now, the, the, how big the effect of the Himalayas is, is debatable. But what we do know is the Himalayas are a, a mountain range in an environment that undergoes a very, very high rate of erosion. And when you have these types of settings where you have an environment with high rates of erosion, what happens is, is as part of that erosion process, you're going to get carbon dioxide being used up in very small amounts. But if it's a very, very big erosional process, like the Himalayas is, there's lots of rock being eroded, that's going to suck quite a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so that's going to help to reduce global carbon dioxide levels once again. That's going to weaken the greenhouse effect and cause global temperatures to decrease. We also, of course, have the KT impact. So right at the end of the Cretaceous, we have this huge meteorite that comes smashing into the Earth. Obviously, that does for the dinosaurs, but it also puts huge amounts of dust into the upper atmosphere. And we've already gone and said, dust in the upper atmosphere is very, very good at reflecting sunlight back into space. And so this would mean that the Earth would be receiving less sunlight, therefore the Earth would be receiving less energy, and so once again it would cool down. And then we have the formation of ice caps. So because the, the, uh, the Earth is starting to cool down, this means at the poles we can start ice cap formation, we can start making glaciers. And so once again that's going to start locking ice, uh, water up in ice, and so that water can't return to the ocean basins. And so as that water is being removed from the oceans, turned into ice, that means the amount of liquid water in the oceans will decrease and global sea levels will drop. And so just to give you some idea, this is what we see by the Neogene. So you notice by the Neogene, global sea levels are looking far more as now. We can see, we just go back for a second, here's the Cretaceous. By the time we're in the Neogene, here we go. You can see that everything is looking a bit more normal. We, now, we can see North Africa, Europe's now fully exposed. North America isn't being bisected by these large inland seas. We have most of uh, Northern uh, South America exposed now as well, and Southeast Asia is now mostly above sea level again. We also have the appearance of ice caps at each pole, and that's gonna help lock up some of this ocean water in the form of ice and that's going to mean there's less water in the ocean, so that global sea level is going to drop down. So glaciations are actually very, very important when it comes to marine transgressions and regressions. You know, arguably, they're the primary control. So when you have lots of glaciers, that means lots of water locked in ice, and therefore global sea levels drop. When you have very few glaciers, that means you've got less water locked in ice, and so that means global sea levels rise. And there are several examples in the geologic record where we can see sea level changes correlating wonderfully with the growth and retreat of glaciers. So, you know, we can feel very confident in glaciers being a very important factor when it comes to global sea level change. So these very large glaciations where we get quite significant drops in sea levels are often associated with several factors converging at the same time. So... One of those factors which we're seeing uh, would be something like land masses at the poles. So one of the things is when you have land at the poles, what this land does is it obviously displaces the oceans. Well, ocean water is actually very, very good at retaining heat. Land is not. And so when you have a big region of continental crust down here it's actually quite bad at retaining heat and so that's naturally going to drive down the temperature at that particular pole 
Another thing is a reduced greenhouse effect. The less, you know, the less greenhouse gases you have in your atmosphere, the weaker the greenhouse effect is going to be, and therefore the lower global temperature will be. So if you have a decrease in something like global carbon dioxide, that's going to help to drive down the greenhouse effect. So during the Carboniferous, um, the Earth was covered in extensive forests, so photosynthesis was running wild. And this meant that substantial quantities of carbon dioxide were pulled out of the atmosphere. So in the Carboniferous, the Earth's atmosphere was extremely oxygen rich. Uh, but this meant less carbon dioxide and so a weaker greenhouse effect. And so what we see in the Carboniferous is we begin to see the appearance of large ice sheets and a essentially a retreat in global sea levels, you see the sea level dropping. Now, the other thing we really need is cooled summers. Now, cool summers uh, is a bit of a difficult thing to actually manage to achieve. And the way you typically uh, make your uh, summers cooler over long periods of time is you change the angle of the Earth's rotation. OK, and you change the shape of the Earth's orbit. And so by changing those two factors, what you can do is you can uh, make it so that during the summer, your hemisphere will receive less sunlight and so that can result in cool summers and cool summers are important because if your summer is cool that means you're going to get less ice melting and so that means during the winter ice will build up and during the summer you won't lose as much of it as you normally would and so this means over time you would have a net accumulation of ice and so your ice sheet would start growing out so the Ice Age is the most recent example of this process. So here's a, a map showing you uh, what we would have what we expected to see during the last Ice Age. We can see that you know a large chunk of North America is under ice, a substantial quantity of Europe is under ice, and a quite large portion of Russia is also under ice. And so what all this ice is doing is it's locking up all this water. That means less water in the ocean basins. And so we can begin to see some differences. So we can see, for instance, Florida looks you know, very chunky compared to its current size. We can see things like Sri Lanka is joined to India, and we can see that Australia is joined to Papua New Guinea. And that's simply because global sea levels are lower. And this is all due to global glaciations. These, you know, these very large glacial events are sufficient to cause global sea levels to drop in a large way. And of course, when these large ice sheets melt, that causes global sea levels to rise in quite a large way. OK, everyone. So that's the end of part one. Before we go any further, though, let's just very quickly do the code word for this lecture. So the code word of this lecture is Texas. I repeat, the code word is Texas, T-E-X-A-S. So please make sure you write that down and put it somewhere safe. Okay, everyone, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.